Hi guys, welcome to another Wordy Electronics Repair video. A friend of mine, Willie, he lives on the island, in fact he lives very close to me, and he is a subscriber on the channel, and he came down a couple of days ago with some stuff, and he sort of, sort of said, oh I found this in the skip, and he said, are you interested in repairing them, just for the channel? And I thought, well, these sort of things are probably not worth repairing, but I know what's basically wrong with this. It doesn't power up. It appears to have a power supply problem. And I was thinking, you know, there's lots of devices that probably are worth repairing that have embedded power supplies like this, so the mains powered little devices. And I've not done any repair videos so far on that sort of power supply. So, you know, I thought it was a good idea. Let's have a look at this and see what we can learn about repairing the embedded power supplies and consumer electronic devices. I'm ready to go, the light bulb's up here. There's an on-off button on the switch, so let's switch it on, so nothing happens on the bulb. Let's press the power button. Well, nothing appeared to happen. The buttons are not doing anything, so it doesn't seem to have powered up. And the light bulb didn't do anything. So let's open this up and let's have a look inside it, see what's going on with our power supply. Okay, I've undone the screws, I've unplugged it from the mains. Let's see if the uh, cover comes off. So usual three screws on the back and one on each side normally gets into these things. Let's have a look. Yeah, it's coming off, with a little bit of effort, it is coming off, let's see if we can uh, probably just slide this backwards a little bit, I'm guessing, to actually get inside it, yeah, that side's off, there we go, they're off, we're in, almost, we're in, Puss and Boots, unofficial copy. So we have a, a power supply and it looks like it might be, I don't know, I don't know if it's burnt or if it's just like old glue that's gone brown on here. And then we have a main board, so that's what's inside it. You can see the power's coming in to the switch and then to the board, there's a fuse on here, under here. So let's check the fuse. I can see the main capacitor here in the bridge rectifier, which is four diodes there. So let's see if there's any voltage inside this as well. I have the test meter on volts. So let's see. <coughs> this is fairly clearly a bridge rectifier. And I can see two positive ends of the diodes here, which I'm pretty sure is a positive supply. And then I can see the two negative ends by the side of them actually, so I think this is probably the negative supply, so we have negative, positive, is there any voltage in it? Well, there's about a volt, yeah, there's nothing of any great amount there, just make sure I'm on the right end, I can see two positives and two negatives here. No, so there, appear, there appears to be no voltage supply, just saying a bit negative, from the black to the cathode, this leads a bit I've got to order some more of these. They seem to be getting worse, these things. As I order, they seem to last for less and less time. Okay, no voltage there, only 1.4 volts. So we can assume, because there's voltage there, that the fuse must be okay, the power must be getting into it. But we can check. I'll just go to uh, Ohm's range on the fuse. And the fuse is intact, as you'd expect, because there was obviously some voltage in the capacitor. Then we have a little controller driver chip. There's no MOSFETs in this. This is quite common for low power supplies like these. The capacitor's clearly gone on the output, so that needs changing, and this one needs changing. So they might actually be the problem with this. But we can have a look. So First of all, let's plug this in, and we should have a supply to our capacitor. And from what I can see on the bridge rectifier diodes, 
This should be the negative end. In fact, I can prove this. Let's just prove it. Let's make sure we know what is what. So, we'll go to diode range. And we'll check them. So this diode is a diode junction. This one will be the opposite way around. Yeah. Positive to the anode. This should be the diode junction. If I can get in there, let's just go again. Yeah, and then positive to the anode. So all the diodes read okay. So we have two negative ends, which is the anodes of the diodes. Are these two connected to each other? Yes, they are. So that is the negative supply rail. And then the two positives should connect together. Yes, they do. So that's the positive supply rail. So we can measure across here, and we should have about, I don't know, best part, 300 volts. I'm on 220 volts mains, or 240 volts. So let's again switch this on. The power's on. I saw the light bulb flick very slightly that time. Let's have a go. So this will be the negative end, and this will be a positive end. And I need to put the meter onto ohm volts, of course, before we do this. So we have volts range, negative end, positive end. 320 volts. So that's what's going into the capacitor. Let's switch it off and see how quickly that drains away. So I switched it off. And it's draining away very quickly, which suggests to me the power supply is actually running, but probably not working because of the electrolytic capacitors over here. The fact it's that voltage disappears, obviously something is discharging this capacitor, which must be the supply running. So now we can see that before we start looking at the data sheet for this. Let's see if we can see it running. So. I'm going to go on the outputs side of it. So we can see this is a rectifier diode. So this is a voltage rail. And it looks like there's a couple more in here as well. The biggest diode will be carrying the most current. So this will be like the main supply. Now the ground on this side of the power supply is effectively chassis. This is the low voltage ground. So I'm just going to connect my negative probe to the actual uh, chassis of the device. We're going to stick it in there. Can you see it? Yeah, just tucked in there, hold it against the side of the metal work. And I'm going to go on this end of this diode. And let's see if there's any voltage coming out of this. Yeah, we have a supply just low 2 point something volts, and then it goes away as the capacitor discharges. It's not a very big capacitor. So I'm pretty confident the problem with this is actually capacitors. We can check again, now I've switched off, that the main capacitor is discharged. I can measure that across the diodes because this will be connected across the output of this little bridge rectifier. So we can see there's about a volt in there, so it's safe to take this apart. Before I change the capacitors, I'll just show you how this basically works. So we have two connectors here. This is your power in, 100 to 240 volts, it works within that range, and this is this on-off switch in here. So, you can see that you have power coming in here, and this goes through this little filter. So this is effectively two windings on two bobbins. It's not a transformer, or an induct well, it is an inductor. It's not a transformer, it's just there to filter out any noise from the switching IC from going back down to the main supply. So that's what that's doing. And this capacitor, if you look, will be wired across the two windings. So we have, i just find my pet. We have a winding in there, and we have a winding in here, okay? So this side of the mains, let's call it neutral, comes th through the winding, to the, this end of the bridge rectifier, the two diodes, one anode and one cathode. The other end of the mains, let's call it live, goes to the switch, through the switch, through the fuse, through the other bobbin on the little inductor, and to the other 
pair of diodes and the bridge rectifier. The way the bridge rectifier works actually is quite simple. So mains is AC. So effectively coming in here, you've got AC, 240 volts in my case, on both sets of diodes. AC basically goes positive and negative. So at one point in the cycle, this end is positive and this end is negative. And in the other half cycle, this end is positive and this end is negative. So if you know about diodes, diodes conduct in the direction of the arrow from positive. So when this end is positive, this diode conducts and the positive comes through to here. And again, I'll draw it on the circuit board. Comes through to here, yeah, the positive. Likewise, when this side of the mains on the other half cycle, when this is the positive half cycle, this diode conducts in the direction of the arrow, and again, positive comes through to here. So only the positive half cycles will get to here. And this is your positive, okay? And likewise, when this side is negative with respect to this side, the current flows through this way, and this is your negative terminal. This is your minus. Now I'll just draw it on the circuit again. This is minus, yeah? And as we saw before with the positive, when this end is negative, again, this diode conducts. So only the negative half cycles come through to here. Only the positive half cycles come through to here because the diodes only conduct in one direction. So what you get across here is basically a DC signal, but it actually looks like this. So it's not steady, it's actually, if you imagine this is naught volts, it pulses at twice the main frequency, 50 or 60 hertz, depending on where you are. So what we have here is this large capacitor. And this capacitor you can see is a 400 volts capacitor. 400 volts, 22 microfarads, I think it says. Kind of gone off the end. Yeah, 22. So this capacitor then smooths this voltage out and charges up to the peak voltage here. And with respect to the negative end, we saw that was 320 volts. I'll probably confuse things by drawing this diagram upside down to the way these are. I hope that didn't confuse anybody. This is positive voltage, yeah? And this is on the positive side of the capacitor, which is actually here, yeah? And the negative is there. So we have, across this capacitor, a high voltage, 320 volts, DC. And you can see that voltage from the positive comes down to here, yeah? And this is the transformer. This is the winding of the transformer. And the other end of that winding, which is here, and we can find that out, we can measure it, we can prove it. We're just on the continuity mode. So, this is the positive supply, 320 volts, and the other end of the winding is here, yeah? There's a little resistance, a little bit of resistance. And that goes to our integrated circuit, this chip here, okay? And the other side of the chip, if you follow the board around, one pin will go to the negative supply. So here's the negative supply coming in, and that will go to our chip, probably here, yeah. Okay? So basically this chip switches the current through this winding. Every time this switch is on, it pulls power through this winding, through the chip, back to negative. Now, you can see this winding is only a couple of ohms. So, that's effectively a short circuit, but an inductor, a coil. When you first apply voltage, in other words, when this first switch is on, the current doesn't flow through it immediately. The current has to charge up the magnetic field in the coil. And until the magnetic field is fully charged up, fully magnetized, the current can't flow through. Once it is, then this acts almost like a short circuit. 
So what would happen is, if this was on for any appreciable amount of time, it would actually short out the mains, you know, in milliseconds. But this chip has been switched on and off at very, very high frequencies, well into the hundreds of kilohertz, maybe into megahertz. So the idea is before this coil fully magnetizes, this switches back off again. Yeah. Once it switches off, the magnetic field collapses again. Okay. The magnetic field collapsing induces voltage into the other windings, which are on this side of the transformer. So here we have secondaries. This is our primary winding, these two. And these are our secondary windings, yeah? And you can see on this one, it looks like there's probably two or three. Let's have a look to see how many windings we can see. So there's one here. That's the winding. It doesn't go to there. It looks like we have a winding there, which doesn't connect to this one. But it does connect to this one. So this looks like we have a winding with several taps on it, if you like. Yeah? Different voltages. So we have one secondary with various taps on it, and we have another secondary. That's what we have there. Now, you might notice that there's another winding here on this side, on the high voltage side, yeah? It's from here to here. This is actually another secondary on the transformer. One end of it will be going to, effectively, the negative end of the main capacitor, which was here. Okay? One end's connecting to there, and the other end, on my meter, will look like a short. But again, there's some resistance. So the other end, if I read to here, you'll see the resistance, one point something, yeah, as opposed to 0.4, yeah? This end of the winding, look, it goes to a diode. Can you see the diode here? And this diode... It's connecting to this point. If I go into diode test mode and we just check, we have a diode junction. Yeah, we have a diode junction. So, well, what's this diode doing here? Let's see where it goes to. Why do we have this other secondary on here and where is it going to? Yeah, what's it doing? Well, it goes to here. And if we look on the other side of the board, we can see that's a resistor. So, if we check from our diode to the resistor, yeah, we have a connection. The other side of the resistor will go somewhere on the board. And I suspect it's going to a capacitor because this diode is effectively a power supply coming from the other secondary winding on here. Let's have a look. Well, it goes to this device, and this is the opto isolator. So it's powering the transistor in the opto isolator. Where else is it going? Because it goes that way somewhere. Well, this is the end of the resistor. We can check because there's 100 ohms from here. Yeah. And that goes to here. Yeah. And this, two pins close together, is going to be a capacitor, and that's this one. So it goes to the positive side of this capacitor. I'm pretty sure the negative side of this capacitor will go to our, yeah, we can even see it. This is the negative coming in. This effectively is our hot ground, our ground point, and it goes to the other side of the capacitor. So when this secondary is generating power, it's going to be rectified via this diode and then fed via this 100 ohm resistor to power up the opto isolator transistor, which is here, and to charge this capacitor that is here. So this, rail, this area will have a DC supply on, the voltage depending on whatever's being generated from this winding. Where's that DC supply going to? Well, we can see it goes to here and here. Let's see what's here on the other side of the board. Well, we can see we have two other resistors. This is quite a, let's see what value is it, is this one. 100 ohms again. And this one, 
as a very high value resistor a mega ohm or something like that yeah so we have two resistors there where do they go to well we can just be sure it's the right resistor because we should read from our diode to here it should be 100 ohms yeah is this going to our chip well if it is it's going to be going from the other end because this is the 100 ohms from the here so this end would be the end that goes to our chip and yes it does so that power from through this diode is sending power to our chip Where's this high value resistor coming from? We know it's one mega ohm. And we know that this end connects to effectively the end of here via the 100 ohm resistor. Where's the end of this one go to? Well, let's see. Let's see. This is the one mega resistor. We can just measure it to be sure. I'm sure we'll see about one mega ohm. Yeah. And the other end of the resistor goes back to the main positive supply so it looks like we've got a power supply coming from the main capacitor via this one mega ohm to our chip and we also have another power supply coming from this secondary via this diode via the 100 ohm resistor via another 100 ohm resistor back to this chip yeah so that's what we actually have. We have two power supplies coming to this chip. Now I think I'd better draw this for you so I can show you what's going on. This is a very common circuit to be quite honest. I'll draw it for you now. I've showed you how to reverse engineer most of this. So we have power supply live, neutral coming in from the main, okay? And we go, the live goes via this switch. So we have an on-off switch. And via the fuse. Yeah. And this then goes into the thing I can't draw because the pen's packed up. I'm sure this is the bad one from last week. Let's put it in the bin. Uh, got rid of that thing. This then goes to through the inductor coil here, and there's two on the one thing. So we have a coil like so, and the neutral basically goes through the same like this. But I say this is not a transformer. You also have from here to here. A capacitor this one so this effectively is filtering out mains noise from here we go to our bridge rectifier basically the bridge rectifier was made of four diodes in fact that was just made of four diodes so we can just draw the uh, bridge rectifier you have one diode like this one diode the other way around like this and from this end we have the same so we have one diode like this and another diode the other way around and as i was describing when either of these ends is positive with respect to the other end these diodes conduct so this is your positive and when either of these ends are negative with respect to the other these diodes conduct and this is your negative and that supply comes out of here and this is where your main capacitor is the 400 volt one the thing that's a bit dangerous 22 microfarads 400 volt so that's what we have there okay then we know we have this chip and we can see that this has a primary winding okay and this is our chip which effectively is a switch 
which goes to here. And this is a high frequency switch. It's a pulse width modulator chip with a MOSFET built in. So that's what we have. On here then, we know we have one secondary with two ends and we have another one with, 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 with some taps on it. Something like that. Okay? On the output side. This chip requires a power supply. Yeah, it needs power to switch on. And it gets that two ways, and we've seen that. So the power coming into here comes in via a 100 ohm resistor, which we can see was, was this one. But it also has A one mega ohm resistor connected to it like this. Then we have the other secondary winding, which is over here. So we'll mark this as being ground chassis. This is what we call hot ground. It's not really safety ground. In fact, it isn't safety ground, but it is effectively our reference point when we're measuring in the circuit. Our secondary winding is on this transformer. One end of it connects to hot ground, the negative end of this big capacitor, relatively big compared to the other ones. The other end of the winding goes to the diode, we can see here. This is our diode. And it then goes through a 100 ohm resistor and it actually connects to, put the resistor in, connects to here. We then have, from here, the capacitor going to ground, hot ground, yeah? We have a capacitor there, which is this one, and this capacitor is 10 microfarad 25 volts so that capacitor is 10 microfarad 25 volts okay and you'll also see if you look down here is another diode and the positive end of the diode the say the positive end, the cathode of the diode which is here actually goes, I'll just follow it, it goes to this chip here, the end of the 100 ohm resistor, that's this end, not the junction with the other two, this end goes to the chip on pin 8, and this is our power to the chip, this is VCC on pin 8, it's power yeah? And this also goes to this diode. Yeah? Cathode and the other end of the diode actually goes back to the negative end of this main capacitor. And you can see if I go to the negative end of the bridge rectifier. Yeah? There. So we have connecting from here to ground, we have a diode. And the diode is effectively the wrong way round to conduct. And there's only one logical reason for that in this circuit, and that is that this diode is a Zener diode. So the Zener diode is like a little voltage regulator. How this works? When you first switch on, you have about 320 volts on here, we can see, yeah? And this one meg resistor, very high value resistor, charges this capacitor up, the other capacitor is going to ground. So this capacitor starts to charge up. Okay. And if you look from the positive end of the capacitor via the 100 ohm, you have the Zener diode. So as the voltage here increases, it will reach a point at which this Zener starts to conduct. Now, I don't know the value of it. I'd have to take it out and measure it. 
But let's assume it's a 15 volt Zener. Yeah. It's going to be something like that. Let's assume it's a 15 volt Zener. We can find a data sheet for this chip and figure out what power supply it needs. But assume this is 15. These two resistors form a voltage divider. And this one, 100 ohms, is very small compared to this one, 1 mega ohms. It's actually, well, 10 times would be 1,000. 100 times would be 10,000. 1,000 times would be 100,000. So it's like 10,000 times smaller than this one. So effectively, we can ignore it in the voltage divider. The voltage here will be much lower than the voltage here by a very large degree. So what happens is, as this capacitor charges up, effectively, the voltage here is going to be the same as the voltage on the Zener, about 15 volts. If you want to do some Ohm's law resistors in series, you can work out what small effect this has, but it's going to be very little effect. So this capacitor charges to about 15 volts. It's a 25 volt rated capacitor, but it can't charge any more because of this Zener diode here. It cannot charge up any more. It cannot go above its rated maximum value of 25 volts. That's for sure. So this chip has got a power supply coming directly from here of about 15 volts. The chip switch is on to start running. When the chip switch is on, it starts to draw current. It's now working, it's drawing current. And the reason this resistor is such a high value is so that this resistor cannot supply enough current to keep this running. Once it starts to draw power, it starts to discharge this capacitor through the under ohm resistor. So the voltage here drops. And this chip has something called hysteresis or hysteresis. So imagine this chip needs, for example, a maximum, sorry, a minimum voltage of 13 volts to switch on. Okay. But once it's switched on, it will keep working down to, let's say, 9 volts. The values don't really matter. The principle matters. This is zero volts. So what happens is this capacitor charges up and the voltage here increases. Yeah. Until the capacitor charges up effectively to 15 volts. It can't be any more than 15 volts. 15 is as high as it can go. Around this point, this chip switches on and it starts to run. It starts to draw power. And like I said, because this can't provide enough current to keep it running, the capacitor starts to discharge. So the capacitor starts to discharge. But it can discharge all the way down to 9 volts before it switches off. At this point, the switch, this switches off. It stops drawing current. And depending on the type of chip, it will either stay off, and this will stay at 9 volts. It won't charge back up. Or this effect will stop drawing current and this can start to charge again. And if it starts to charge again, this comes up again until it reaches enough voltage to switch it on. So what's happening on your capacitor basically is this. And I, may, I need a bit more space to draw it, yeah. It's doing this. It's charging up to 15, discharging down to about 9 volts, let's say. It's charging back up switching off yeah so this chip is switching on and off i don't mean on and off driving this coil it's running at a high frequency it's running or not running running or not running so without this circuit that's what this would do we would continually power on and power off power on and power off or depending on the type of chip it might power on once and go off and stay off until you remove the mains and power it back up again once this capacitor is discharged and all the voltage has gone away. So what we need for is for this to keep on running all the time, yeah? So this is where our little winding comes in. Once this starts driving and it's effectively switching the current on and off through here, this then induces a voltage into all the secondaries. And this secondary 
induced voltage is rectified by this diode and fed back through this 100 ohm resistor. This is a 100 ohm. To here. Yeah. Now this supply can supply enough current to keep this running. So what's supposed to happen when you switch on? This switch is on. And before it can drain this capacitor to a sufficient to switch back off, this supply comes on and feeds power back into here. So this has got power. And now it'll keep on running as long as this circuit's working. And that's what you're supposed to do. If you've ever wondered why some switch mode power supplies, like the light comes on once if there's a light on it and goes off, dim and stays off, or they kind of pulse, yeah? If they're doing the pulsing, it's because of this sort of problem. There's a problem stopping this supply working. Either a faulty diode, faulty resistor. Very common, this capacitor goes low value, high ESR. So it can't hold much charge. So when this charges up, it charges up very quickly. But as soon as this switches on, it discharges very quickly. And by meaning very quickly, it discharges faster than this thing can get running. So very often that capacitor fails and that's why the power supply will not start it cannot provide enough current for long enough to keep this running for this supply to come on yeah. or the most common problem is that you've got short circuit rectifier diodes over here so with a short circuit over here in the secondary as soon as this starts to run this effectively puts a massive load on it so it's not inducing enough voltage into here, it's not inducing enough voltage to here, so this never starts running. It's like a safety device, basically. It shows if you have a short, or if you short the output, this supply will go away, and this will shut down. Yeah. Now we've sorted all that out. There's a few more things we can talk about. This, the uh, opto isolator. Is monitoring the voltage on the output and it's using a little chip called here, here called TL431 I'll show it to you in a minute and this circuit basically when the output reaches its set voltage this comes on turns the opto isolator on and this then stops us generating more voltage it regulates it I made a very good video on this area of the circuit how to hack any power supply to change the output voltage and i'll link that one from this video at the end so if you want to know how this area of the circuit works i suggest you watch that video now all we really need to do is look at these capacitors and change them and see if it actually fixes the problem because we can see our power supply is actually running we're just not getting proper output voltages just before we do that, I will just show you this little chip. So this is TL431, can have a different uh, prefix, LM431, UA431, KIA431, and no doubt plenty of other options as well, because you're made by many, many different manufacturers. But this is effectively the reference that sets the output voltage using two resistors. And as I mentioned, I made a whole video about that, which I'll link at the end of this one. So if you want to know more about that, you can just watch that video. These capacitors are not particularly critical in value. You need to replace them with the equal voltage or higher. So you can put a higher voltage one in. And at least the capacitance that is rated. But if you replace this with like a 1200 or 1500, if that's all you have, it really shouldn't be a problem. This one's a 470, 16 volts. So again, you want a 16 volt, we could put a 25 in there, and you can want a 470, but you could put a thousand in there, really, or a 680 or something. Um, you can see these are marked 105 centigrade, so you should replace like for like. And these capacitors on the output of a switch mode power supply will be low ESR. So you want low ESR capacitors. So I'm going to use these. So these are low ESR, 105 degrees centigrade. This one is the 1016, so it's the same rating as the original one. And this one is a 470 16. Again, low ESR, 105 centigrade. So let's put these in our circuit board and let's see if it now works. Come on. 
quite easy just to fit these. That was in 16, a little bit bigger physically. Make sure you put them in the same way round as you took the original ones out, by the way. If you put these things backwards, they will explode. Although usually make a sizzling noise first, so if you hit, if you're quick enough and you switch off, they might not explode. If you hear it sounding distressed, yeah, but sometimes you don't get that chance. You just go bang. Okay. So there's the capacitors replaced. I'll just uh, cut the leads off. Some people like to cut the leads off first. Some people like to cut the leads off afterwards. I tend to do them afterwards. I honestly don't believe it makes the slightest difference. Although there are doubts, some people saying you must do it one way and not the other. In my opinion, it really doesn't make a difference. And some people like to solder them first, then cut the leads off, and then just touch them again with a soldering iron. So you know it's which method you prefer or if you have strong thoughts about it get in the comments below and let us know yeah in the comments so i've replaced those capacitors by my favorite method let's see if this actually now works we're ready to try i've decided that this brownish deposit is just old glue and it may be conductive but i'm not too worried about it personally I'm really just fixing this to show you guys how to fix the power supplies, but it, some people again say it's a good idea to, to clean this sort of stuff off if you find it. I don't think on this side of a single sided board it's going to do any problems yet. On the other side, maybe. It's always a good idea when you've done this sort of repair to uh, put the light bulb back in circuit. So I've set it back to the limit. I'll just put the camera where you can see the bulb. So if anything goes wrong and there's a short or something, all that will happen is the light bulb will come on. Nothing more dramatic than that will happen. So we can plug the power in. It's switched off at the main at the moment. I've just... <laughs> so we can plug the power in. It's switched off at the main at the moment. So we can switch the switch on. And let's just power this up now and you can see if the light bulb does anything. Well, basically, I saw the disc spin slightly. Ah, look at that. So, it's now working. Yeah. It's now actually doing something. Let's see if we can get a picture out of it. Okay. So, there we have it. Yeah, it's playing. You can see it. As we can see there, this device is actually functioning now, it's working. And although it's not of any particular value, you can see the repair was very simple. It was just replacing two capacitors, it was easily spotted what the problem was. And these are, cost a few cents. In fact, you probably have parts like this lying around. If you've been doing electronics for a while, you'll know that have a, a stash of new and salvaged parts. So they're quite simple to repair. You'll also find this sort of power supply, as well as being in a lot of consumer electronic devices, you'll find them in industrial equipment, in commercial equipment, point of sale tails for instance, all sorts of kit you will find with this type of power supply in. And hopefully you can see, by doing a little bit of reverse engineering, in this case I didn't even look up the data sheet of the chip, we can work out how they work. And you'll find that most of them work in the manner I have just described to you. So it's not difficult to figure out, once you have a basic idea of the function, which bit is doing what, and from that work out where the problem is. So I hope you enjoyed that video, even though it was a pointless repair really but hey i don't know if your kids are watching the films on it and you've got a few capacitors why buy why buy another one yeah but anyway that's semantics only thing left to say really is i hope you enjoyed this video i'll certainly be making some more soon so see you all soon on another word electronics repair video and ciao for now guys